This is chapter nine. The goal here is to look at how the Bayesian approach to uh, linear regression. You probably all have done linear regression a million times using RLM or, B, or GLM or any of those other models. So now we're going to look at, we're going to finally apply these tools that we have been using, these Bayesian tools to linear regression. Amma, you have your hand up. So, so this is just a side note. Um, is there a way to color book down? I'm so used to this white on gray on very, yeah. Probably, <laughs> I don't know what it is. But yeah, because- I'm no expert it, at this, it, trust me. I don't enough yeah. mark down to get myself in trouble. That's about it. <laughs> I was happy when I learned how to put LaTeX in here. So. <laughs> are, you talking, are you talking about, Amar, are you talking about like uh, coloring the background or, or the text? Y yeah, like the background, because- Yeah. Like with Dark Quanto, mode. it's everything. Because even with normal um, markdowns, you can do themes and then there's like some more, or oh, this is a theme they're using, which is giving it that color, right? Mm. Maybe. It's just a side note. It's just, I'm used to yeah. all of them usually have I'm this sure, and then- I'm, I'm sure there is a way. I just, I don't know what it I mean, is. And you're talking about AMA for Quanto, not for markdown. Like, is that right? No, I think for, for book them. down. Oh, book I down. know quite, for Quanto, there it, Quanto is so many colors, so I use a lot of themes and they have colors, but this is like the standard, if you open anything that is in book down, most of the time it looks like this. They have yeah. colors in like the pictures and stuff, but like the yeah. background is all this white. I think point, it's, yeah. it's just the, it's the, de it's the default, so no one, you know, I'm sure it's just something we could figure out. Yeah. Okay, so back to this. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Look at the Bayesian approach to simple normal regression. And what I said, simple normal regression, not ordinary least squares, because it's not ordinary least squares, as I was commenting earlier, is probably, I think you can show this the same if you use flat priors, you get the same, at least you get the same median results. Uh, so as part of that, we're going to look at prior, flat prior models. What kind of prior models should you use or can you use? Uh, we'll simulate using Monte Carlo Markov chain posterior samples, posterior models of the regression parameters. And then we'll look at that to under, help us understand the relationship between a response and a predictor, right? And we'll build models of the, we'll also do posterior prediction, right? That's one of the three things we do with Bayesian models, right? We look at the posterior distribution. In this case, the posterior distribution is going to be of the parameters, the slope, the intercept. And we look at hypothesis testing. We won't talk about that in this chapter. And then posterior predictive, like, okay, I want to predict a new value. I need to use both the sampling distribution and this uncertainty in the parameters as well, right? So we'll do that during this unit in this chapter. Uh, first of all, this, this, I kept this in here. This is from the previous guy. The previous guy's got a little bit of sense of humor. I had to tone that down quite a bit in some, in a lot of these, but this one I had to keep because it's so funny. It's great. We're now in a new unit, unit three. That's halfway through the book. So, I mean, I looked at my bookmark at the end of this chapter, it looks like we're about halfway through the thickest part of the book, but you know, I mean, there's like an appendix or something, but we're at least halfway in terms of the units. Uh, unit three is all about regression. As you saw already, we're gonna talk about logistic regression in the future. Uh, we're gonna talk about categorical variables. We're gonna talk about Poisson uh, regression. And then uh, unit four is the hierarchical, hierarchical. That sounds like I'm saying that wrong, but hey, I said it, it's out there. And uh, hierarchical, uh, which is what um, I know Ryan was saying, he uses that in his everyday life. So maybe he'll complete some of those chapters and help us learn what all that means. Cause uh, I've never used it before. I've often, it seems to be one of the main, um, uh, what am I trying to say? It seems to be a big selling point for Bayesian methods and that can do this hierarchical. I mean, all the other things we've been doing, you can do with kind of classical methods, interpretational issues, of course, but with hierarchical, it actually is a whole new like, um, thing mm -hmm. the killer app that's what i was trying to think of it's the killer app of uh, bayesian there you go so uh, i don't know what this apparently there's a book called bayesian probably for babies i looked at there's a you can google this there's a youtube video that kind of walks through it's kind of goofy <laughs> but kind of fun <laughs> there's there's a whole series of books for babies for every like quantum physics for babies and gravitation for babies and all that kind of stuff so bayesian probably for babies i think he put that in there because there's the baby going yes we made it halfway there unit three Oh, this, so this is half, this is halfway. Wow, I didn't realize yeah. that. There you go. So again, uh, we're going to be talking about regression. Now, this is the first opportunity we have for really applying Bayesian to an actual something. I mean, usually you're not going to be just uh, looking for the distribution of a, of a variable. You're really going to be trying to do some kind of 
uh, fitting learning. This is like machine learning now, right? So we're going to learn from data. Uh, and the new, this is called new terms for this chapter, because even though you guys are probably all familiar with this, somebody reading this book may not know what a predictor and response variable is. So, and also just to kind of harmonize our terms. So in this book, response variables are the variables that you're looking to predict, right? And predictor variables are the variables you're using to make that prediction. Um, and there's kind of, if you're analyzing a quantitative predict, uh, predictor, excuse me, quantitative response, that's called regression. And if you're doing a categorical response, that's called classification. This is well known, I'm sure, to all you guys. In this chapter, we're going to focus on normal regression model. And normal doesn't mean like out of, not out of the ordinary. It means simply that the response uh, is normally distributed about its mean. And the difference here between previous chapters is now the mean is going to vary with respect to the predictors. Uh, and that's uh, what we're going to do, basically. This, uh, this, the formula down here is just stating the, what, we just, what I just said, that the uh, response is normally distributed about the mean, like it has been in previous chapters. But the difference now is the mean is going to depend on these predictors. Oh, they gave an example. Oh, we want to model the number of rides per day. That's our response. And if we want to know, we could use, for example, the temperature of that day as a predictor. How much does the number of rides per day on this ride share, bike, sorry, bike sharing service depend on the temperature? We might think, oh, it's warmer out to be more riders up to some point, right? Because in Arizona, when it gets too warm, where I am, there's no riders, I'm sure. It's, 100, mm -hmm. it's a critical heat day, what I call it, a heat warning mm -hmm. today. So to build this, we first start with the data model. The data model in this case is where it's going to start simple with one predictor and one response. So you get these n pairs of data that are the predictor and the response, y and x, right? And we are going to model this using uh, what they call in the book a local mean, meaning simply that there's a mean that the mean depends on the predictors. If I swap, if I swap the, the word predictor and response too many times, just, you know, Put up some kind of symbol on the screen. <laughs> do, they, do they have a symbol for "Hey, stop being dumb"? No, probably not. In any event, the uh, local mean now is then this given by this equation here, where the mean now for each predictor point, ah, I got it right, is going to be some function of that predictor, which is going to be an intercept times the slope, because we're assuming it's a linear model on the predictor. So the higher the temperature or lower the temperature, whatever it is, depending on how whether beta is positive or negative, the more or less uh, ridership we expect that day in this particular case so mathematically this looks like this where the response is now uh depends on the slope and the intercept depends on the uncertainty right the, the standard deviation of that normal distribution um, and it's going to be distributed according to a normal distribution with mean mu sub i and variance sigma squared where mu now depends on the predictor this beta, it's just a line. It's beta zero plus beta one times xi. That's what it looks like mathematically, but you get the idea. You just have a line, right? And at every point along that line, whatever you like, you pick temperature 75 degrees, I can say, okay, what's, and I, or let's say I've already got a prediction for beta zero and beta one. I plug that in there, right? And they'll, they'll tell me some mu for that day. And then I have to draw from a normal distribution with that, with, uh, with that mean mu and the standard deviation sigma to tell me my, what I think with the temperature. That's the model, what the temperature was on that day. Oh, Alma, you've got your hand up again. You can just also just jump right in and interrupt me. That's fine. <laughs> no, I, I, when you finish your thoughts. So uh, this might be basic, but what was the IND on the mm. tilde thing? Yeah, yeah, so that just, the tilde there means distributed by. And the right? IND is like. Independent. That they are in, yeah. independent. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, independently distributed by the normal distribution. So that's important, actually. I'm glad you brought that because that actually is critically important. Mm -hmm. this, this critical assumption that each one of these data points is statistically independent. It's something we'll, we'll talk about, in you, I guess you'll talk about in chapter 10, where they, you, you have to think about that and maybe test for it. I don't know if he goes into testing for it, but let's talk about worrying about that, whether they're actually independent or not, or normal. For That's another, obviously, issue, right? It's an assumption here that we're making. Oh, here it is. That's actually yeah, here's the assumptions. <laughs> Structures data, right? Is independent for one, for one day is independent of another day, right? That's a little confusing because they wait a minute. It depends on the temperature. Yeah, it depends on the temperature, but after the after counting for the temperature, it's independent each and every other day. Uh, and the the other assumption is the structure of the relationship is, is linear, and then finally the structure of the variability is normal. Those are the assumptions that go into this normal 
linear regression model, right? I mean, I'm probably just pounding this into the sand too much, but <laughs> I felt it was important to get our bearings on this whole thing since we're switching gears so differently from the previous chapter, right? Yeah. Okay, so then quiz time. What are the parameters? Now, remember, what we're doing, we're going to do Monte Carlo Markov chain. We're going to estimate parameters. We're going to estimate distributions of parameters, right? We're going to start with the priors on those parameters, and then at the end, we're going to have posterior distributions on those parameters. So just to catch, make sure everybody's on the same page, what are our parameters? Oh, man. Anybody? Beta zero, beta one, and then sigma. Yeah, exactly right. See, of course, I mean, you read the book, you know, that's what it is, but it's, it's, good, it's good to remember, right? What are we trying to do? That's what we're trying to determine. Those are the things we don't know. We have X's and Y's, we got the data, we don't have those parameters. This the, so the Bayesian trick now is we're gonna take the data to determine the parameters. Our model tells us the data given the parameters, the Bayesian trick, remember, is to turn that around, right? That's the whole point of this whole thing. So that's what this says. Yeah, beta zero, beta one, and sigma are our parameters. And so the first assumption is that the parameters are independent and our second assumption here is we're going to use some kind of distributions. Now the book use you don't have to use this particular this, this particular priors, but this is the prior distribution that the book used for this particular model. It's a good one. Why not? I mean, beta zero, we don't have any reason to believe that it's it's a real number. It's the intercept. It could be anything from negative infinity to positive infinity. So a normal distribution seems reasonable here. And so we're gonna have some hyperparameter on that beta, some M0, the mean of the of the prior, right? And some variance S zero squared, which is the spread of our uncertainty in the prior, right? Same thing for the slope. And then for sigma, sigma can't be negative. So they use an exponential common. I hate that's a cop -out. It's commonly used for these kind of cases, but it, it is. And it's a good match because exponential, it does, it's always positive and it gets, distribution goes down and you get larger and larger uh, sigma, which is what we kind of expect, right? We don't think sigma is huge. We don't think it's, you know, we think it's more likely to be something small, right? Um, so that's our, our, we put, so all these, I'm sorry, I just threw it out there, hyperparameters, but that's what these are called because they're the, somehow the parameters of the parameters. And that's a very common term in Bayes analysis, the hyperparameters. What are your hyperparameters in your priors? And, and this, and, get, and just get used to it because I think in hierarchical, it gets worse where now you've got the hyper hyperparameters or something. Cause <laughs> I think, or something, I don't know if that's what they're called, but there's three levels now in the, in the, in the hierarchical. So putting that all together, this is our model. Again, repeating what we already said, that the Ys are distributed normally with a mean that depends on the predictor and slope and intercept. The intercept, we start with some prior distribution, slope, some prior distribution, and we have a prior distribution in our in sigma squared. By the way, this is new too, because remember the last chapter, we just took sigma squared as fixed because we didn't, was that the last chapter? Maybe that's maybe well, maybe that's way back in conjugate family. It was, one, yeah, chapter yeah. five. Yeah. It was, yeah, so, we just like assumed that I guess in previous times we did, known, we did let that go. Which is yeah. like a silly assumption. Because right. if you know the mean, then like you should probably also know the standard deviation. Yeah. <laughs> so that's our model. And he just kind of gives down here a uh, little one, two, three, four. This is from the book too, the little call out box. It, it was useful calling out here too, is what is the steps for building a model? Well, first you got to figure out like, what is the model for the data? That's this Y sub I, right? It's normally distributed. Um, will depend on whether the data is discrete or continuous. And we have discrete, uh, why is discrete or continuous? In the future, when we do logistic regression, it'll be discrete, and this will no longer be the kind of model we have. We'll have a um, logistic uh, regression instead, right? A Bernoulli distribution or binomial. Um, for then we want to rewrite y as a function of the predictors for linear regression, which is almost all we're going to do. It's going to be a linear function, right, of the predictors. Identify the unknown parameters. We did that. It's the slope, the intercept, and the and, and the uncertainty in y. And then note the values. There's a typo there. Uh, and then try to figure out what kind of range can these values take on, and then that'll help us identify appropriate priors to use. And for in the book, they talk. I'm not going to walk through all this, but uh, they do a pretty good job in the book. But they look at the average temperature. How many drivers could you expect? They look at like what you know what kind of slope you know we just look at the data plot it out you say okay what does it look like uh, what is it what is the slope you know just by eye look like and how much do we think it can range to where it makes sense and that's what they did here to come up with these priors so they said oh the oh there's one little technical thing here and that it's the beta zero is the intercept at zero right uh that's the intercept to line it's the intercept at zero but the zero degrees fahrenheit is not really a, a good day to look at and try to eye by eye 
uh, approximately how many riders there were. So instead they look at the centered intercept, the intercept what, when you subtract out the mean. And not only is that what they did here, but that's also what how this our stand arm package that we're going to use works as well. It uses the centered um, for the prior. Oddly enough, it spits out the distribution of the actual intercept, which is actually convenient because you want the actual intercept to do predictions. So you don't have to worry about the centering, but you only when you're doing the prior, you should use the centered one for R stand arm. For stand itself, if you use raw stand, as we'll see, you would need to actually do this yourself. You have to figure out, okay, what is the intercept uh, distribution? So yeah, that's what that beta zero C is all about. So it's on a mean day, it's about 5,000 riders with big and big uncertainty, right? Because you want the you want big uncertainties, your weekly or not even weekly, your big prior. So you make them vague by making the uh, sigma squares, the variances, the standard deviations big, right? Um, and then for sigma, for exponential distribution, there's only one parameter, um, which is both the mean and the variance. So that, or one over the mean, I should say. And you just, you know, he said, well, you know, uh, we expect that the standard deviation was about something like 1250 so exponential with that standard deviation uh, or see i'm sorry to say yeah we don't have the standard deviation expect what the, the mean for an exponential that matches that would have a parameter a rate parameter 0. 0.0008 so that's all that's all about fortunately i should say i shouldn't say this but uh i mean i shouldn't say fortunately i should say though um we will find that we're going to do less and less of specifying the priors as we go on throughout this book because the packages that we're going to use will help you with this and give you weekly informative priors, which the book talks about, and I think is also in these slides coming up soon. But what I mean to say is if this is like, ah, this seems like a big pain, I'm worried about getting these priors wrong, uh, don't worry too much about that. We will be talking more about uh, priors and, and testing priors and trying out different priors, I think, later in the book. But in the meantime, they're just going to be using kind of weekly informative priors that these packages will actually estimate for you based on the scales of the data. Uh, so, in any event, um, here's what the uh, data looks like, right? Before we do the posterior simulation, this is what the data looks like. This is just GG point with GG smooth. If you're a GG plot expert, you'll recognize all things. If you're not, all it does is plot the data and then put a, a, a quick linear model line through it just to give you something to draw, guide your eye as to the slope of the. So this is the this is the actual data. The rides on a particular uh, day and the temperature on that particular day plot as a scatter plot. So you can see, oh, there does seem to be a trend as the temperature gets warmer, there's more and more people willing to go out and ride their bikes. These people that are out there at 50 degrees Fahrenheit um, riding their bike are the diehards right there. <laughs> but they're out there. Uh, I believe it's Fahrenheit. This, this is like British data, I think, right? It yeah. doesn't, yeah. So now, the, so we, I talked about this R stand arm, right? Um, that's the package that they use a lot in this book. Um, it's um, R stand plus arm, applied regression model. So it's a particular package that uses R stand underneath to do the regression modeling, but it takes care of a lot of things for you, like setting up the plus, let's setting up all that math, right? For you setting up that R that stand file. Remember, we had to make that big stand file. It does that all that for you in, in, under the hood. Um, so it uses this notation, which is nice because you guys are probably familiar with this notation from doing LMs and GLMs and all that, right? This is the how you specify models in in R in general, right? So you just specify your model, you give the data, you tell it the family of the data. In this case, is normal, it's Gaussian, which means normal, um, and you can specify. In this case, we're just going to specify the, the priors that he already gave you, right? Um, and this is just a standard Monte Carlo Markov chain thing. Okay, four chains. I want five thousand uh, times two. And again, he uses this five thousand times two to remind you that it's going to burn the first five thousand, and then it's really only, you're really only going to get five thousand samples, or four times five. Uh, and then his favorite seed bays, right? <laughs> You're supposed to read that in calculator uh, as bays. Uh, so, or because we should not forget how to do. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ama. Okay, so. Basically, um, in the book, when they were talking about it, they had a, um, there was a figure where there were like 200 lines, like this, how like the 200 prior lines might look. And then there was also a side one where there was like a faceted plot and there was like, these are how um, four of them can, the data oh. can look in four different cases. So is that what 
hours than MCM is doing, like generating data points? Like what does MCM? So the, uh, the, the plot you're talking about was the prior plot, right? Yeah. So that was a, looking at the prior. So it was just like prior simulations of what kind of data you could have seen yeah. given your prior knowledge, right? And just to see if yes. it's going to make sense. So that's not from our stand. That's actually just from just, you can just do that with your normal. Yes. But I think our stand, well, now I said, doesn't our stand have that capability? If you like do prior equals true or something? I don't know. Our stand, M, I mean, no, stand I, I, I do get that. But I'm saying, is that what MCM does? Like, what is MCM doing by like iterating so many times? Like, oh, so what it's doing is it's taking, it's, it's, Putting all that stuff, remember from the earlier chapters, right? We take our prior model, then we take our likelihood function, which is that y sub i, you know, the, the, in this mm -hmm. case, it's a, a normal distribution, right? We combine all that mm -hmm. together, and now we want to calculate what's the posterior distribution. That's what the Monte Carlo Markov chain does. And again, if you want to remind yourself about that, go back and look at uh, chapter six. Um, it's worth looking okay. at again to remind yourself how that works and work through. If you haven't done, by the way, I find it's extremely useful to do some of these practice exercises, especially the practice ones. The conceptual ones are great too, but the practice ones, you really should at least pick a few. I don't have time to do all of them. So when I go through this book, I just been like highlight, oh, let's do like one set of these. Like in the in chapters six, I did like the grid approximation just so I could understand a little bit more about how the Monte Carlo Markov chain works. And I also did like um, uh, the beta binomial one in chapter six to remind myself, but yeah, it's definitely worth doing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah some, i'll it's, try it's those fun. If, you know if you, it's fun too you could it's, i think of it like doing knitting or something i'm just doing this it's fun and exercising my brain i could be doing crossword puzzles but i'm doing this instead so <laughs> right if you approach okay. it with a fun attitude you can have fun with it for sure especially when you get some good yeah results. so and if you have so that explains in depth on the mcm okay yes yeah Absolutely. Okay. Explains how the how the Mark, Mark, Monte Carlo Mark, and then chapter seven talks about Monte Carlo Markov chain under the hood, how it actually works. But chapter six just uses it, and chapter seven talks about how it actually works by sampling the space. It does this little random walk around the space where it tries to hang out in areas where it's more likely, but also has some chance of going of going toward areas where it's less likely, and that's very very high level explanation. But yeah, that's what the Monte Carlo Markov chain does. Thank you. No, no worries. So this, uh, the book then also has an optional section, which I did repeat, or I should say the previous group did repeat in here. And it's worth looking at. So like, this is our, this is our stand arm. If you wanted to, you could do this directly in our stand. You don't need our stand arm. You could write out your own stand model. And that's what this is. It's just, uh, it's worth looking at in a little bit, um, uh, maybe on your own, because we're running a little short on time, but um, it's worth taking a look at this optional section and saying, how do I actually build this up, right? So remember, you have to tell you what the, what the range of the types of the data are, what the types of the parameters are, and you have your actual model, which is a normal, excuse me, that the response is normal with this mean, beta zero plus beta one times X with variance sigma or standard deviation sigma. Beta prior is a normal distribution, beta one prior is a normal distribution, and sigma is exponential with these priors. So that's how you specify the model by hand in uh, our stand or even in any stand that's how stand works then you you can call stand just like we did in the previous chapters with this model giving it the data you have to pass a list but um for the data in this case but yeah that's all that our stand arms doing under the hood for at this point we haven't it does more because as we'll see you can leave out the priors and our stand arm will pick reasonable priors for you which is kind of cool uh so this model what we'll get out of this we'll get five thousand times four um uh simulations of our parameters that's the whole point of the Monte Carlo marketing we get we get samples we get simulations of the parameters um I do, I do want to point out that our even though we gave a beta zero c for the prior the samples will be for the intercept the actual intercept beta zero and beta one is the slope in in, uh, in uh, oh I guess in, in the point of that was that in um our stand arm will use the name of your actual parameters so it's going to call intercept intercept it's not going to call it beta zero it's going to call beta one temp feel which is not the actual temp feel but actually the slope on that temp field that's i think all the linear model all the bar stuff does that so it's not too un too unfamiliar uh so just to remind you we need to check if the simulation went well does anyone remember how we do that <laughs> uh we can look at trace plots 
um, to make sure that we want to see if it's white noise, then uh, autocorrelation function. So you can just like plot the ACF, right? Of each yeah. for each chain with the idea is that should like exponentially decay like pretty quickly um, as like, you know, the lags increase. Uh, you should see like a sharp drop off. Then you can also look at things like um, the effective sample size ratio, right? Like how, what, like of our 20,000 like samples, uh, like what, how powerful it is if, if, if it was just like a, a set of independent samples and then the R hat, which compares the total variation of like all of the chains um, to like the variation in any individual chain and that you want to see it around one. Well, I'm impressed with Robert's uh, recall on this stuff. I, I think I, even I just recently looked at it, it's like, what were all the methods again? <laughs> I, 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 I've been doing this stuff. I've been doing this stuff at work now. So that oh, I'm just like, it's in my, let's see. Yeah. You do it, so. I, they always say, if you do this stuff in anger, they call it right. When it really matters, <laughs> then it you really sticks a lot better. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's huge. I mean, it's huge to have like yeah. a real, to have real yeah. problems to solve that makes yeah. all the difference. Yeah. So that, that's basically what Robert says, all those little things. Just check your usual things you need to check to make sure that your Monte Carlo Markov chain, you need to do some diagnostics on your chains. Make sure your chains are healthy before you start doing any actual interpretation of what you have. So now we're going to go to interpreting. Um, so you get this bike model, which is the data from the RSTAN arm, right? And you can use, for example, uh, you can tie it up with the broom. You have to use broom.mix to make this work, but because um, broom.mix has more of the overloads i guess for the methods right of method tidy but you can get some get some ideas of what it looks like okay what was the intercept minus 2000 you know whatever with this what's the error on the intercept uh this is from the posterior though right this is just all this error on the intercept is is the um, standard deviation <laughs> of that those samples right it's nothing magical going on here uh this confidence low confidence high these are i assume 90 percent confidence interviews I, i'm not sure how uh, uh, this is 80 Oh, that, oh there i'm sorry there, I, was yeah. gonna, I was looking for that parameter so 80 percent confidence levels are these are again just quantiles from the date from the simulated points There's nothing magical going on the slope it turns out to be 82 degrees per i'm sorry 82 writers per degree right that's what the units were with this kind of error on it right um and we have some pretty good confidence that it's between 75 and 88 so that's a great result right there right um yeah so and then the, the standard deviation you know, this is the uncertainty, the sampling uncertainty on a given day is 1200. So it's pretty, even though we have a pretty good model for how many riders we expect, typically on any given day, it's going to have a lot of variability just because there's a lot of very natural variability in how many people are going to ride that day. And, oh, what the heck is mean PPD? I don't remember what that is, actually. That's not one of our parameters. That's something else. Mean PPD. Mean posterior something maybe oh maybe that's just the overall mean of the posterior predicted values of ridership i'm guessing somehow my eyes glazed up when i looked at this thing last time um what does that mean i'm guessing it's the mean of the forget about the the temperature what is the mean uh riders right in the prediction data and the standard deviation in that uh yeah i'm pretty sure that's what it is don't quote me on that okay any event he doesn't talk about that so we don't need to talk about it anymore so we get immediately this posterior median relationship that the if you want to predict the number of riders on a given with a given temperature you plug your temperature in here multiply it by 82.16 and subtract uh, 2000 194.24 and there you go there's your prediction for the mean number of riders you should expect on that day right and we can plot that line and he's also plotting on here i think more lines right let's see but yeah fitted draw so what he's doing here is not just plotting he's not plotting not just a typical line but all the variations of the lines right that's what these all these all these are different lines sampled from so each I mean, let me say it differently. Each point, right? He's only each point in each point in the posterior samples gives is is a set. It's a slope. It's an intercept, and it's a sigma, right? So forget about sigma for right now because we're not plotting that. But it's a slope and an intercept for each one of those lines. So he took fifty of them at random from those posteriors and just plotted those lines. And that's what it looks like. This gives you an idea 
visually of the uncertainty in your fit of the line, which is kind of cool, right? So there's not a lot of uncertainty in the fit of the line. It's pretty good. But keep in mind, this does not take it. This does not show any sampling uh, probability yet. We're just looking at what is the posterior in the parameters, alpha, uh, sorry, beta zero and beta one, right? And what that means for the lines themselves. Yeah. So the quiz here is, do we have a good evidence that there is a positive association between ridership and temperature? And I mean, we don't need to wait for a quiz. It's obvious that there is, right? We see that the it's the 80 percent uncertainty is, is 75 to 88 that doesn't include anything close to uh zero right um if we were to make an hypothesis test we might say oh is it greater than zero or something right but it's actually better than that so you can say it's we can say fairly confidently that's like around 80. um what else did they say yeah uh we can see visually right just visually it, it goes up right um uh, we have of course new, i said that much about the numerical evidence and then we have numerical evidence in the posterior probability which is what we're going to look at down here i believe oh yeah he does do the test right so here's the hypothesis test so it doesn't exceed zero oh every single every single posterior sample is bigger than zero <laughs> it turns out all twenty thousand posterior samples are bigger than zero not one uh, is negative so not one of our posterior slopes is uh is negative so that's pretty good evidence, right? So at least from our data, we say with 100% certainty, at least with, with the 20,000 samples we have, that uh, it's bigger than zero, that there's a positive relationship. Does that make sense? Did I overstate that anyway? Probably overstate it a little bit because we may do some more samples, pretty sure, but um, yeah. Oop, I guess I should. I did not, okay. All right, so now we're going to talk about the prediction, which I've kind of hinted at already a few times about this prediction thing, because uh, I sometimes say things out of order, anyway, <laughs> which I apologize. Uh, now we're going to make a prediction. Okay, the weather report says tomorrow is going to be a 75 degree day. What is our posterior guess at the number of riders that we should anticipate? Okay. Don't no, we can't. You probably don't have the formula handy, but how do we come up with the answer, right? Well, let's just go ahead and move along because um, we have two things, two kinds of answers we can get. We can just use the formula that we do, we fit to the slope eighty two and the intercept that we fit to, and come up with this three thousand nine hundred sixty seven. But that is actually um, only taking into account uh, that's only the median, right? So that's one way to make a prediction. Well, the median is this, but that doesn't take into account all the possible variability, right? There's two things you have to take into account: this, the the sampling variability, which is from sigma, and also the posterior variability, and that we haven't nailed down alpha, I mean, excuse me, beta zero and beta one completely. We know fairly a lot better what the range of those parameters are. We don't have it nailed it down completely, right? So we can, though, use the model that we have to do a posterior prediction. We can say, okay, for a 75 degree day, we can actually just say, okay, use all the samples that we have and calculate a whole bunch of these median temperatures or uh, typical temperatures, right? Um, using all those samples, we have a beta zero and beta one. And then also using sigma, we can then calculate using a normal distribution, what they add the sampling variability on top of that to figure out what is the range of possible number of riders, right? What is our predicted, I should say, what is our predicted distribution in the number of riders? That's kind of what we really want to know, right? And that's what he, that's what all this math does. I'm not going to go through all that, right? Oh, it doesn't make a plot. I wanted a plot. I don't want to make a plot here. This needs a plot. Um, there's a plot in the book, though, that shows this. But basically, it looks like two bell curves, right? And so there is, um, so he predicts two things here. First, the mu for that day, right, which has some uncertainty on it because we don't know mu that well. And then also the, the y nu, the actual distribution in predicted riders on that day. So there's a difference, right? One, we're just calculating what is the average, what's the distribution the average riders expected for that day. And the second one, what is the distribution in the actual riders we should expect for that day? Those are two different things, right? And one is, of course, much narrower than the other one. Uh, here's the ranges, right? So for mu, it's much narrower. The, we, the, the, uh, our prediction for the average number of riders on a 75 degree day is from 3,800 to 4,000 or 4,100 approximately, right? That's what this is right here, right? But if we actually want to know what is the range of possible riders on that day, it's something between 1,500 and 6,482. That's a, he says 80%. Yeah, 80%. Is that really 80% though? 
Looks like 90%. Right? But whatever, some quantile. I don't like to do math in public because I'm terrible at it. Does that make sense? Am I, am I making that at all less muddy? So we should expect something between 1500 and 6042. If we look at lots of 75 degree days, we should expect the mean of them to be within that narrower range. Right? Yep. And no, oh, sorry. So this is all this is all done with from scratch, just using normal, you know, I'm going to look at the code a little bit, a little bit. Um, you, and any, any exercise is one of the, if you do like the practice, I did the penguin one for this chapter, which is fun. Um, I, I didn't do all of them. I just did all of the three penguin ones. And they have you do this. They have you do it by hand and they have you use the, uh, the not by hand method. So you do it by hand, you get, um, you're just going to use the actual data. Okay, what was the intercept? I'm just going to take all the intercepts. I'm going to take all the uh, temp fields from my predict from my bike model, which is, remember, these are the posterior samples and calculate mu from that. And then for using that mu, I'm going to calculate what y nu is because it's just normally distributed, distributed, sorry, um, with distribution sigma, right? That's what he's doing here. So, and you can see, uh, he adds them to that data frame. So here's the muse and here's the, 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 the uh, a, a particular sample from that normal distribution for that day with that mu. But you can shortcut all this using our stand arm has a built in function called posterior prediction. We can just say, Oh, give, give my bag model. Here's my new data. In this case, you're just using uh, a single, you give it a data frame because you can give it multiple days, to, multiple temperatures to predict on. But if I want to just predict on one temperature, I can give it that one. Uh, temperature and he doesn't actually show in the notes here what that gives you out but it's on where is it at it's the same kind of output data though yeah it's on page 230 if you want to see how he actually uses that function um, to actually make predictions Once he has the shortcut prediction data frame that comes back from this function, you can then pass it to things like posterior interval or MCMC density to get predictions uh, to plot uh, probably distributions. Okay. Yeah. Again, it's something you'll do in the exercises, so you'll become very familiar with it, presumably, for a second. And then, like me, you'll probably forget it by the next chapter, <laughs> but at least you'll, you'll know for a second. Unless you're like Robert and using it in anger, you'll probably forget. But that's okay. This is like an exposure. You're being exposed to this stuff. And when you have to use it in anger, you'll go back and relearn it again. That's how it always seems to work, right? Yep. <laughs> always. Yeah, yeah, always. So in this last section, he, in this section of the chapter, I'm not going to actually go through this. I just mentioned it briefly that he goes through the sequential regression modeling. Whereas if you just got the data piecemeal, you could, you could update your posterior piecemeal. We've done that before in previous uh, chapters. Uh, finally, uh, this is this topic about using the default RSTAN arm prior. As I mentioned before, the RSTAN arm can help you figure out priors for you. In the book, they the book recommends using them. They, they, instead of doing vague priors, it does weekly informative priors. And you're like, if you're like me, you're like, what is the difference between a weekly informative prior and a and a uh, big prior. Um, vague prior? Does anyone know? Actually, that's one of the questions I have. <laughs> it's actually one of the conceptual questions in the back of this chapter, which I'm like, ah. And the book says that weekly informative priors are similar to vague priors. Weekly informative priors reflect general prior uncertainty, right? I guess that means that um, whereas a vague prior might be so vague that it puts weights on nonsensical parameters. I don't know. I guess two thirty four. Yeah, I just yeah. That. I don't know what that. I can't really turn that into a, a good like <laughs> oh, definition. Is it like, is it kind of like um? Because I gotta just. I, I feel like it's not for me. What is it like anger? So I just like anxiety. <laughs> what I'm like doing this at work <laughs> is um. If like I, I remember, I was reading from like uh, some fun post something on GitHub. I think like uh, Andrew Gelman wrote it. It's like if you put a oh, normal okay. prior of like zero with mean zero and like standard deviation of million that's like a vague prior that, that's like very vague because oh, also okay. i mean would you expect the standard deviation to be like 
a million, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. no, probably not. I guess like maybe that's one of them where okay. depending on like, like that's probably nonsense, right? To like have that high of a standard deviation, although it's like a proper prior mathematic, oh, right? I, see. I think. Don't quote me on that, but that's no. I think that thinking. is. I think that that's ringing a bell now from uh, something I read somewhere else too. Yeah, I think that's right. So if you have a weekly informative power, you're actually using the what the data actually looks like and what you're understanding the thing a little bit more stronger to say, okay, this is you know the range of sensible values. Now I know why they use the word sensible because you, you're like, okay, I know this. I can look at the data. You probably could exclude things like you, could, uh, you know, negative slopes in some cases. If you're for sure, it can't possibly be negative, for example. So that makes sense. Now, our stand arm does its own version of weekly informative prize using the scaling of the data, basically using like kind of the spread of the data to try to inform the distribution. This is what it calls it calls auto scaling. What is this window for? Um, so you can, as they did in the book, say, OK, the prior intercepts is normal distribution. I'm still going to give it a mean, but I'm going to say auto scale the um, standard deviation. Uh, same thing with the prior for the um, Oh, so the terminology is a little weird. I guess we didn't talk about this. But prior intercept is the intercept in the prior. Or prior intercept is the intercepts prior. Prior with nothing is the prior on the slope. And prior aux is the prior on the, the standard deviation. I guess this is something you have to know from the documentation. God help you if you can figure out where, where the documentation that is. But R is great, but the one thing I don't like about R is the documentation. It's sometimes be like really weird. <laughs> I feel you on that one. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, what thank God for you Google. To do? <laughs> or, like, or like, my biggest problem is give me just a decent example. Yes, that. why you can go through an entire page of like what every possible argument and optional argument is, and not one single example. It's like, come on. Or the example is so weird. You're like, yeah, oh, yeah, you know, but not yeah. applicable to what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So such is life. Any event, using the auto scale will give you this weekly informative prior. In fact, with our stand arm, you can just leave all this off and all that, but all this prior stuff off completely, and it will come up with some reasonably good priors um, for you already. And you can ask it after the fact, like, what kind of priors did you give me by using this prior summary? And we'll tell you, oh, here's what I ended up doing. I ended up putting uh, a, a normal distribution with the mean that you gave me. Oh, but oh, I'm sorry, this way, this way you specified, right? It actually does. Um, actually, I just realized now it actually does more than I thought. It doesn't just change the uh, standard deviation; it also changes the the mean. Yeah. Hmm. So it didn't change. Huh. I get, I, does it take these as hints then? Because here it left a lo- location for the uh, intercept. I gave it a location of five thousand and a scale of two and a half, right? Standard deviation, uh, but it adjusted it. It didn't adjust the um, the mean; it only adjusted the variance in that case. Hmm. I have to read up on that. But in any event, it does some adjustments. Uh, same thing with the coefficient prior. Um, I gave it a 2.5, which is ridiculously narrow. I just ignored that and put a much wider uh, a very standard deviation. It kept the mean and normal. It kept the mean zero, but I'm not surprised by that because that would be weakly informative. We don't we don't want to put any bias into the slope before we do that. We're trying to determine if there is a slope, right? And for sigma, we gave an exponential of one, right, which is really way out of the ballpark. But it came back with its uh, rescaled um, prior. Of 0.00064. So, right, plot some prior summary so you can get back what it did with your priors, and then you can plot them. And um, this gives an example here plotting the priors that it used, right? Um, I should say this gives you. Um, wait, what is this? I don't know why there's two of these. Um, the first one, it says it's from fig 9.5. So that's what I was telling you about where you did the like 200, like, oh, I see. So the one on the left is our prior that we used before, right? Yeah. And the one on the right is the weekly informative prior that it's using. So it's much weaker. It's actually our fire, our vague prior is less vague in some ways than, uh, than the weekly. And also like, what's also weird is like, (laughs) there. There are like some plausible lines where it's actually negative, the slope. Yeah. Right? And not, like only all is, about not only is the slope positive. negative, but not only the slope is negative, but also the number of riders is negative, which doesn't oh, make yeah. sense at all. <laughs> but it's okay because it's a prior and it'll all work out in the mix kind of thing. But that's, yeah, they said, it did say in the book, it did call that out in the book that you will you notice that it does actually predict these weekly informative priors are very weak. Um, 
But that's but this is what you'd expect because the 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 our stand arm doesn't know that Riders is actually a uh, integer positive variable. We're we're approximating an integer variable that's greater than that's always positive, a natural number by a normal distribution, which is a real number that can be negative. So we shouldn't be surprised that our stand arm doesn't know that fact and thinks that Riders is a perfectly valid could be perfectly valid as a negative number. Maybe we should use a different distribution, but. Um, because the number of rides is uh, well centered, we uh, normal distribution seemed uh, good here, but we could have used maybe a binomial or well, actually maybe a Poisson distribution or something might have been better. A different choice one could have made, I should say. Yeah. yeah. I, actually, now I say it out loud, I, I haven't really thought about that. I'm like maybe I should, what if we actually did use a Poisson distribution for the rides instead of. Uh, I like, oh, I know. They said they couldn't use a put sum yeah. because the mean and the variance were different. But there's something else you could use, like a negative binomial, I think. I, yeah, yeah, negative binomial would work here. But we haven't learned how to do negative binomial regression yet, so they didn't want to use that. Do we learn? Yes, we do. Chapter 12. Yay. <laughs> so in chapter 12, we will maybe, maybe in chapter 12, they'll revisit this. I don't know. Yeah. That'd be cool if they did. Anyway, uh, what else is there? So that's kind of the whole chapter, but um, they say here, hey, we're not done yet. And this is important. Oh, we lost somebody. Oh, did he have to go to yeah, meetings? Ryan. Yeah. Did he, chat, did he chat to us? I didn't see it. Yeah. He still has these meetings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not done yet. See, now Ryan doesn't know this important fact. I'm assuming he might <laughs> know this important fact. Don't go off and use this <laughs> because you've only learned enough to be dangerous. Don't go do it. Go off and fit your favorite models right now with this uh, R stand arm. Wait till it finished chapter 10 to learn how to evaluate and understand these regression models. And that's so what gonna... that's what Robert talked about doing the R hats stuff and trace no. plot. No, our hat and all that is evaluating the Monte Carlo markup chains to see if you get reasonable okay. results from them. Now the question is: Is the model, the overall model, we're using reasonable? Right? Is this this by no? Is this a normal distribution? Are they normally are they normally distributed? Uh, is a linear a line a good thing? Is the data? Um, I think in, we'll talk a little bit about the is the data a, a good data set? Is it you know, maybe biased in some way? Right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's in that chapter too. I did read a little bit ahead, but I think he calls it unfair models, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's like dealing with wrong. I'm just like scrolling through dealing with wrong models. Yeah. So that's what chapter ten is, and Ama is going to tell us all about that um, <laughs> <laughs> next week. Well, not me. I'll just have to watch it on the video, but I will. Um, be glad, be glad to uh, learn more about that. So in summary, what we did, we did, we did look at the very first steps. And I think, by the way, I want to reiterate something I didn't, I, don't, I want to reiterate, I want to emphasize something that I kind of just briefly mentioned, and that is this is the first time when we really need a Monte Carlo Mockup chain, right? Because we couldn't use any of our, we can't, do, we can't do the integral, <laughs> right? We can't do that crazy integral. It's on page 220. Uh, where is it? We can't calculate the denominator, right? That yeah. big integral. It's on posterior, so no, like nine. Yeah, page two twenty at the top, right? Uh, that's the integral we'd have to do to do this analytically, or to do it with. And there's no con conjugate families we can appeal to here. We kind of have to use some kind of numerical method uh, to do this. I mean, it's not, I mean, in truth, it's actually not such a bad integral. It's only three parameters, but it's starting to get up there. Um, and nobody wants to mess around trying to do that integral or numerically doing it. Already doing a three dimensional numerical integral would be a nightmare. So we're already, we, we can definitely turn to our old friend, Monte, our new friend, Monte Carlo Markov chain in this chapter, right? Uh, so what we, we did do that, we used the simulated samples to summarize our posterior understanding and did some posterior prediction. And like I said, in the next chapter, we are going to dig into evaluating these models, which I'm looking forward to. Um, now, as far as the exercises in this chapter, uh, we're running out of time. I just want to mention that I did do the penguin part, 916, 917, and 918, and 919. Those four is what I chose to do. That's, uh, I definitely recommend going through the conception ones yourself, just making sure you understand things. We did talk, I did throw a few of those in as we went along, but um, in 
you pick one of those sets. You don't have to do the penguin data just because I did, but if you do the penguin data and you have questions about it, I might be able to <laughs> answer. But um, there's also one on the hu on humidity, and there's also one on that does some more with the ridership, or do multiple ones if you have time. I just didn't have time to do more than one of these sets. And at this, I did this last night, the penguin thing. It took me a while. Oh, I, part of the reason I took a while is I didn't use RC. I actually did this with PyMC because I'm I'm trying to. Uh, I'm, I'm mostly a Python guy, so I wanted to make sure I could keep my PyMC. I haven't used it for like six months. I'm like, okay, let me see if I remember how to do this. Well, it turns out I really didn't remember that well, but I was, <laughs> I was able to to get it done finally. Um, and yeah, and if, by the way, if anyone else uses Python for this stuff, there's a cool tool set called Bambi that uses PyMC that's yeah. sort of like our stand arm, um, kind of gives you the same kind of tool set. That's all I had. Um, anyone have any fall any final questions or comments, concerns? Yes. So, um, like in my journey into the world of bays, I I heard about jags and bugs and in Stan, are they equivalent or one is better or I have used jags in one yeah, of my too. base classes. I Compared to Stan, I, I hate Jags personally. Like I find the syntax just a lot more unintuitive, um, but I think it also uses a different sampler than I know our Stan does. Yeah, Jags is just another Gibbs sampler uh, and that's yeah. what it does. And where Stan uses uh, Hermitian Monte Carlo method. I don't know, if, is Jags even still, well, I guess it's late through April, 2022. I kind of think Jags has kind of fallen out of favor. It seems like. Don't yeah. quote me on that. Okay, it, it was in the puppy book, Jags. Yeah, that's where I, that's one of the yeah. main reasons why it's still kept alive because yeah. the puppy book is so great. I, that it uses Jags. It, it, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people still use Jags. I but. also feel like there's a lot more academics that still use Jags, which I feel like oh, okay. sometimes maybe some. I don't know. It's maybe it's like a, like more of like a lagging indicator, right? Or it's like if yeah. they're still where I think like most people, and again, this is just me speculating. Probably use like something like RStan or like BRMS, like Brims. That's uh, or a uh, PyMC and Python. Um, don't forget about don't forget about uh, the Tensor. Probability. Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah. TensorFlow probability. TensorFlow probability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've never really, used it, but yeah. And I feel like, I don't know. I mean, even like me, who I would be lying to say if I knew Stan, uh, I just find it <laughs> like way easier to like specify a model than I like Jags. I just, ugh, it was awful. <laughs> I just remember it's in my classes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, concerns? Uh, oh, I will say again, if, you, if you're working through the exercises, feel free to start a little thread, uh, you know, to make it on the Slack channel. And mm -hmm. if somebody does start a thread like that, it's, it's polite to just reply to it in, uh, to create a thread from the, their thing. Or then, like, I, oft, I, I have a bad, I, this is mainly for myself because I have a bad habit of just, like, posting. I'm on a bunch of other Slacks where people are really sloppy. So we just, like, post, you know, right underneath and make a big mess in the Slack. But if you can, try to, just try to remember to do a reply in thread thing that will keep it cleaner yep oh cool, this is great thanks yeah, guys thank and you. i'll see yeah. you next time see ya. yeah thank bye, you everyone. bye bye